Okay, so today we're going to look at how to write a summary for question two, language paper two. First of all, what I would like you to do is I would like you to read source A, and that is entitled The Bloody Nosed Beetle, okay? And I would like you to have a go at stating which of these statements are true or false. Remember, you are looking for four statements. So out of these, A to H, which four are true? Pause the video now in order to do that. Okay, hopefully you've done that now. And here are the answers. So check your answers against this slide. Okay, so that is going to be question one on paper two every single time. And you will always be asked to read source A. Having done that, that will give you four marks and you should be doing that in about five minutes. That's including the reading of the source. Let's remind ourselves of the difference between explicit and implicit now, because that is really, really key to the next question where we're going to look at writing summaries. So first of all, what do these two words mean? What does explicit mean? Explicit means the writer states the information clearly. It's obvious and it's absolutely written in front of you. Implicit means reading between the lines. That means working out what the writer might be suggesting. And it's that word, suggesting, that's really important. So which statements then, out of the four that you identified, are explicit? Which are implicit? The beetle does not move fast. Are you told that directly or do you have to work that out? The beetle has six legs. The insect is a herbivore. The beetle produces foul tasting blood to ward off predators. Well, you're absolutely told B and H explicitly, but you are not told A explicitly. You have to work that out. The beetle doesn't scuttle, it, it stays on the path for quite some time. Have a look to see if the word herbivore is used in the text. That will tell you whether it is an explicit or implicit statement. Have a go now at the memory retrieval practice. Remember, do this without, without checking your notes from the previous session. You need to pause this while you do these questions. So pause the video now. Okay, so let's just get my, my laser pointer up. Question one. What is the first thing you must do when attempting a summary question? The most important thing that you have to do is to highlight the keywords. You absolutely have to do this because if you don't, you will not get any marks. The biggest mistake that students make is failing to address the question. They write a summary, but it is not based on the actual question and therefore they get zero. So this is a really important step. Question two, how should you structure your summary? Really importantly, you need to structure your summary using PEE. -E. That is because you will then address all of the assessment objectives. Your point is obviously addressing the question. Your evidence is embedding support for your point and your explanation contains your inference. Why should you embed quotes? Well, you need to embed quotes because it's quicker. If you state, this is shown in the quote and then you write the whole line, it takes much longer and you only have 15 minutes to answer this question. So it's really important that you embed short, precise quotations and you are not repeating yourself. Finally, 
Where should you include an inference? Well, you've been taught that you should include an inference on in your explanation. That is important. However, you could also include it in your point. So make sure that you have got those four key ideas written down about how to address this question because they are really significant. If you do not understand this, you will miss many marks no matter how hard you try. Okay, so we're going to now look at how the question will be written in the exam paper. So, first of all, you'll notice at the top, the title is Comparative Summaries. Previous to this session, we have focused on how to write a summary, but this exam paper will ask you to write a comparison. This is different to your first paper, your paper one, because in paper one, you only have one source, but in paper two, you have two. And you need to refer to both source A and source B, and source B for this question. So let's have a look at the question. Both sources describe what they discover about beetles. That's just a statement. Here is the task. Use details from both sources to write a summary of the similarities and differences between the writer's experiences of finding beetles. So you have been asked to write a comparison. You will notice that this is worth eight marks. Step two then asks you to read source B. You have already read source A to answer question one. So it makes sense to start with source B for question two. As we read, you are underlining the key phrases that address the question. Remember, we are focusing on the writer's experiences of finding the beetle. This is source B. Now this is a pre 19th century text, so it will be quite challenging. I will read it with you and we'll identify some of those key phrases together. This bit here is the preamble at the beginning. We do not need to highlight anything from here. It is a description about the source. It is useful for question four, however, which is why they include it. So this is the extract from Charles Darwin's autobiography. In the 19th century, the scientist Charles Darwin developed his theory of evolution, one of the most important scientific breakthroughs of all time. The following extract is taken from Charles Darwin's autobiography, first published in 1887, where he describes how his interest in the natural world developed whilst at Cambridge University when he began to collect beetles. But no pursuit at Cambridge was followed with nearly so much eagerness or gave me so much pleasure as collecting beetles. So pursuit in this case means activity. And he did this with really, really keen eagerness. It was the mere passion for collecting, for I did not dissect them and rarely compared their external characters with published descriptions but got them named anyhow. So he didn't cut them up, he just enjoyed the collecting of them. It's nice to know. It tells us here explicitly that he was passionate about this. I will give proof here. I will give proof of my zeal. That's another word for passion. One day on tearing off some old bark, I saw two rare beetles and seized one in each hand. Then I saw a third, a new kind, which I could not bear to lose, so that I popped the one which I held in my right hand into my mouth. Okay, we can assume that his collecting habits were a little bit bizarre then. Okay, a little bit strange. First of all, this shows his passion again, the tearing off. He was excited about it. Okay. And the fact that he couldn't bear to let one go that he had spotted, but he had both his hands full, meant that he had to pop the one that he was holding 
in his right hand. Okay. Alas, it ejected some intensely acrid fluid, which burnt my tongue so that I was forced to spit the beetle out, which was lost, whoops, sorry, which was lost as well as the third one. Okay. The fact that he didn't realise putting a beetle in his mouth might cause the beetle some discomfort resulting in it attacking him also demonstrates his lack of forethought because he was so passionate and excited about what he was doing okay obviously it put some acrid some very unpleasant liquid into his mouth which unsurprisingly hurt okay i would hope you would know not to put a beetle in your mouth okay so he spat the beetle out he was forced to do so all right but in doing so, he also dropped the third one, didn't have a chance to. So he was quite upset about that. So that demonstrates his passion, really. OK, if we go back to thinking about his experience here, OK, we understand that his experience was passionate. Here we understand that it was painful. Over here, he goes on to say, I was very successful in collecting and invented two new methods. So this obviously became a professional activity for him, something he did regularly. I employed a labourer to scrape during the winter moss off old trees and place it in a large bag, and likewise to collect the rubbish at the bottom of the barges in which reeds are bought from the fens, and thus I got some very rare species. So this obviously became quite a professional activity for him because he was employing somebody and he was doing it regularly enough to be able to identify a range of species. He then goes on to say here, no poet ever felt more delight at seeing his first poem published than I did at seeing in Stephen's illustrations of British insects the magic words captured by C. Darwin, Esquire. So here he compares himself to a poet in that his descriptions of the insects, the beetle, are as good or as exciting as a poem. So here we know that his experiences really were delightful for him. He absolutely enjoyed them thoroughly. Okay, so what I would like you to do now is I would like you to pause this and I would like you now to highlight on your copy of the text three key quotes that you think demonstrate Darwin's experience in finding the Beatles. Okay. So moving on to the last part of our planning stages, we have already read source B and we've underlined the key phrases that address the question. Take some time now to number these one to three. Once you've done that, our next step is to read source A and underline the key phrases that address the question. Once we have underlined those key phrases, you need to then match them to the numbers from source B. So if you've numbered Darwin's excitement and passion as number one, you need to look at source A and decide if that's a similarity or a difference and whether you can find evidence to prove that. And then you would number that number one. So let's have a look at source A together. As I read it through to you, underline the key phrases that you think address the writer's experiences in finding the beetle. The bloody-nosed beetle, a tank on sticks. Wider than a thumbnail, almost as thick as a thumb, a black beetle with a shell-like polished shoe leather was lumbering along a well-trodden path. The word lumbering means slow and heavy. Striking out in slow motion for the grassy edge with a six-legged doggy paddle, this bloody-nosed beetle, Timarcha tenebriscosa, I can just about say that, that's the Latin version of it, gave the impression of a wind-up toy winding down, so going slowly. Watching this great tank on sticks was akin, was similar, to seeing the open workings of a mill, like a windmill. A collection of mechanical parts moving in sequence to drive the greater whole. Each skinny segmented leg bent at the knee 
released its hydraulics in turn and swung outwards. The forelimb seemed to give a cheery wave to the world as it scooped at thin air. Then it arced forward, tilting the, be the beetle's body. A pair of claspers on its feet bit at the ground, opening and closing, opening and closing, giving a cue to a leg on the opposite side of its body to repeat the lift and crawl action. The overall effect of these alternating slow flailing limbs was to rock the great carapace to and fro in a kind of geriatric drive, jive. So here the writer spends the entire focus on describing how the beetle walks. So that demonstrates he's probably watching it quite carefully and is really interested in it. That last section that I just read to you, the slow flailing limbs was to rock the great carapace to and fro in a kind of geriatric, geriatric jive, demonstrates how he's almost amused by the beetle and amused by the way the beetle moves. A jive is a dance and geriatric means old. Okay, so it suggests that old people are dancing and a jive is a fast dance as well. So there's an element of sort of juxtaposition there. However, he therefore clearly enjoys watching it because he's amused by it. This is slightly different to the previous one, the one that Darwin wrote, because although Darwin is interested, he doesn't take time when he collects them, he grabs at them to take them away with him to watch. A pair of feelers conducted the operation, tasting the air with extravagant flicks of antennae that were beaded like strings of costume jewellery. Bulging racing goggle eyes added a touch of sporting style. All the while, the beetle's mouth points chomped, although it was not clear to what purpose, since they were held well above the ground. Was this the herbivorous insect's version of chewing the cud? Now, cows chew the cud, okay, not insects. So this is not a scientist's um, observation. This is a writer's observation as he tries to recreate it for his reader. Therefore, there is a suggestion that he is not as professional, maybe, as Darwin. I have never seen this Beatles pièce de résistance, his most impressive performance and nor do I really want to. A ladybird bleeds foul-tasting blood from its knees when it feels threatened. I didn't know that. The bloody-nosed beetle gets its name from a ruby droplet that it, that it exudes that comes out from its mouth when it's threatened under similar circumstances. I did not wish this beetle to spill its blood on my account, so I didn't want to threaten it, that's what it's saying, nor did I want to get more than a bloody nose on the path. A finger ramp was enough to entice it onto my hand. The beetle tickled its way up into my palm and I shook it off onto the safety of long grass. So here, the writer shows how careful he is in picking up the beetle. Unlike Darwin, who grabs at it and then pops it into his mouth, this writer does not put the beetle in his mouth quite sensibly. Instead, he gives it a little finger ramp so that the beetle can crawl up his finger, okay, and then he carefully puts it into his palm and puts it on the grass, keeping it safe, not threatening or hurting it. And because of that, he is not attacked by the beetle, which again is different from the previous experience. So pause this now, just to double check that you have identified some key similarities and differences in this writer's experience. Remember, you're only looking for three and you do not need to analyse language in this particular task. You're only looking to summarise the experiences. So just choose three quotes and match them by numbering them one to three to the quotes you identified in Darwin's extract. Okay, I'm assuming you've done that and you've paused and move on to the last, uh, second to last slide. So here, again, we now need to focus on the similarities and differences between the writer's experiences. And down the right hand side here, I have put a list of words and phrases that might describe their experiences that you could help 
yourself. Okay, so here's the table. We're going to create this table to help us understand how to structure our answers. This is the bloody nosed beetle source and this is Darwin's source. You need to choose which of these fit into which source and you need to match them up. So this one here is an explicit statement about Darwin's experience. He explicitly states that he is passionate. So we could put that in there. You then need to choose which one of these, okay, is a similarity or a difference of source A's experience. And you pop that in there. You then find me a quote to put in either side. And then you state whether that's a similarity or a difference. Underneath the quote, you then need to put, this suggests that, and you need to make an inference in your explanation. And you need to do that three times. Once you've completed that, that's what I want uploaded and sent to me on Show My Homework. In order to help you recall the planning steps in this activity, in this question, sorry, you need to complete this slide as well. Okay, I look forward to reading your answers.